morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose Online. We're thankful that you are gathering with us and celebrating with us uh, the opportunity to worship the Lord this morning. We are going to be finishing up the fourth uh, message on a four-part series entitled Thankful, and we're going to be talking about the power of a thank you. And I think you'll really enjoy the message. It was just a real blessing to me to prepare. But before we go any further, I want to have you check in. If you'll take your cell phones out and check in by texting to the number 408-547-4911. 408-547-4911, the word here and your first name. If you've never checked in with us before, text the word CONNECT. Follow the prompts. That'll get you uh, signed up for our, our database, and that way we can stay in touch with you and you with us. This is a great way for us to get information out to you quickly, and it's a great way for you to let us know of anything that we can be supportive of you. Uh, for instance, prayer requests. If you would like to uh, request prayer, text the word prayer to that number. We can come alongside of you, pray for you, whatever that need may be as you let us know what that is. It's a great way for you to give uh, if those, for those of you that are meeting uh, with us only online and uh, would, where, would care to uh, support us through our, uh, through our website, you can text the word GIVE. That'll take you to the giving portal on our church uh, website and you can follow the prompts to be able to give from there. We appreciate you doing that. Uh, this is a great way for us to let you know what's going on. We text out uh, titles of sermon series, we text out special needs, we text out church events, and that way you're immediately in the loop and you don't have to worry about missing a Sunday because all that information is there. We also have a uh, church newsletter that goes out every week through constant contact. It goes out into the email. If you're not getting that and you would like to be signed up, we, I write a newsletter every week and we give out church events and things like that. You can text the word constant contact to that number and we'll make sure you get signed up and, and put on our um, email database. We appreciate you uh, wanting to do that. This is a great way also to hear my heart as I share a lot of different things in those newsletters. Some humorous, some serious, some informational. And I think it's just a great way for you to just hear what uh, God is, is uh, placing on my heart. Uh, coming up this next month as we head into December and we're getting ready for um, all the different things that uh, we do in preparation for Christmas, decorating the house, decorating um, offices. We just got done decorating the church. Thank you to everyone who helped do that. It was a great turnout and a, and a great opportunity for us to hang out, have pizza, and decorate the church at the same time. But uh, one of the things this year with Christmas holidays, uh, Christmas Eve is falling on a Sunday. So here's what we have planned. Sunday morning, we are going to have a celebration morning. It's not going to be uh, a regular church service, although there will be uh, opportunities to hear the word, opportunities to be encouraged in your faith. Uh, we're going to have a breakfast. We're going to have a breakfast. We're going to have games. We're going to have giveaway celebration. We're going to have a brief devotional. We're going to have the Christmas story. All of that um, in regular church time. And it's going to be just a day of celebration. And then coming in Sunday night at 5.30, we are going to be um, continuing on our, our annual tradition of a New Year's, excuse me, a Christmas Eve service where many, many people come out. Probably one of our best attended services outside of our Easter service and so a lot of families will come and they'll just celebrate with us before they go home to celebrate with their families and we just value that choice we value that people would want to spend that time with us on such a sol not a solemn but such a celebratory uh, evening and we are going to make a big day of it we want you to be a part of that so just put that on your calendar Christmas Eve day uh, is a Sunday morning, we're going to be celebrating the Lord here at the church, and then Christmas Eve night, we're going to be celebrating a candlelight Christmas Eve uh, service with worshipful music, uh, I believe to be a very timely and powerful word, 
and the opportunity for us to um, just worship together before Christmas Day, which is going to be on Monday. God bless you. We're going to be uh, having a little time of worship, and then we're going to be going into the Word, talking about a, the power of a thank you. God bless you. See you in just a moment. this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God the still inside the storm the promise of the shore I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first beyond the barren place beyond the ocean way when I walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way, so I am not afraid. You keep the promises you make. There isn't one that is delayed, so I will not lose heart, here I will lift my arms, and start to sing into the night, my praise will call the sun to rise, declare the battle.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this morning, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate your support. I appreciate you being with us, whether you've been a longtime uh, watcher, attender online, or this is your first, or you've just recently joined us. Um, we appreciate you. Thank you for taking time. And uh, we uh, do not take lightly um, your watching and being a part of uh, what we do every Sunday and bringing God's word, bringing hope, and uh, we just pray that this has been just a small part of your, uh, your faith development, faith encouragement. Uh, maybe you're just checking things out and you're not sure where, where you're going in life, what journey. And we just want to encourage you to, um, to consider Christ and what Jesus has done. And you will hear that all the time coming from this message uh, uh, through our every, uh, every Sunday gathering is pointing us to uh, a Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the power that he brings in our lives to face whatever situation, circumstances, obstacles you may be facing. And so um, we just say thank you. We say thank you to the Lord. We say thank you to you, to one another. We say thank you to those who lead us and guide us in our faith say thank you to those who are living examples of, of Jesus Christ. So, you know, if I were to say, if I were to ask you what is a thank you, um, you would have probably um, different answers. Uh, many of you probably hitting around the same idea. Uh, I just have, uh, just real quick, um, just three things that a thank you is. A thank you is showing appreciation. You know, when somebody does something for you to show your appreciation for them to do that, what do you say? Say thank you. Maybe you give them a card. Maybe you give them a gift. Sometimes I'll give a, a Starbucks card for, for, to show appreciation to somebody who's done something for me um, out of their way, out of the generosity. Uh, just a small token. And, um, and so I just want uh, people to know that they're appreciated. Another thing I thank you is it's, it's expressing acknowledgement. Um, driving down the road when you're uh, seeing somebody that wants to get over and California traffic is, is not what it used to be. It used to be people would see someone getting over and they just let them in. Uh, nowadays, it's like a battle. You know, everybody's racing ahead because they don't want somebody else to get ahead of them. And so I, I've really been one to just kind of back up a little bit, I wave my hand, or I'll flash my lights, let him know to go on over. And uh, once in a blue moon, I mean once in a blue moon, somebody will raise their hand and say thank you, and or I appreciate that. Many, many, many times somebody will just get over and it's just like, ah, it just irritates me. So to me, to say thank you is an acknowledgement of something that's been done on your behalf. So you're acknowledging, you're aware, you're not clueless, you're not selfish, you're not, you know, taking that for granted. So thank you. I, I'm acknowledging that you did something for you. Another thing I thank you is, is an awareness. You know, we go through life in so many different capacities, so many different ways. And then when somebody does something for you, um, you, you are aware of that. And because you're aware of that, you acknowledge it and you, um, you show it. And so I think there's an awareness that, that just comes with knowing that within our culture, we're not deserved somebody's graciousness or somebody's thoughtfulness, but it's being aware that, that that's being provided for you. So it's an appreciation, it's an acknowledgement, it, it's an awareness. So who do we thank? Uh, we usually thank those who have either done something for us or have a certain presence in our lives. And I think for us, you know, we, we thank those. And then we talked about this. We've been talking about, you know, what we're thankful for and who we're thankful for. And so there is, um, there is a, um, uh, there's a, 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 I believe, a responsibility on our part to express that. 
And so 1 Chronicles 16, 34, Moses wrote, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And then Daniel chapter 2, verse 3, he says, I thank and praise you, Lord. And so the, the, the very first or the very pri, uh, priority of our thanks goes to our Lord and Savior. It goes to God. And so uh, as we head into um, uh, our message this morning out of Luke chapter 17, um, Daniel said, um, I, you know, what, how we, why do we thank God? We thank God for who he is and we thank God for what he does. And so we're all in appreciation to him for that. You know, as a parent and now a grandparent, I believe it's important to have our children, grandchildren learn appreciation. One of the ways to express our appreciation is that we constantly remind Millie, our two-year-old granddaughter, uh, to use her, her, her words, her words of kindness, to say please, and then once some, somebody does something for her, to say thank you. And a lot of times we, we have to prompt it. You know, okay, Millie, what do you say? What do you say? Thank you. Or Millie, what, what do you want? Okay, what do you say? Please, Papa, please. And so we, we're, we're training, teaching her. But you know what really melts my heart is when Millie says, thank you, Papa, and I didn't even ask her to do that. It just comes from a, um, an appreciation out of her own little two-year-old heart. Thank you, Papa, and that just melts my heart. You know, research tells us that um, grateful people are happier and they're more likely to maintain good friendships. It reduces stress, improves our sleep, it floods our bodies with positive endorphins that energize us instead of the hormones that leave us feeling drained and depleted. Gratitude and appreciation are also essential for a healthy relational life, whether it's at work or home. In fact, the number one reason why people will leave their jobs or will, will feel um, lost in a relationship is that they don't feel appreciated. Uh, a simple thank you or a show of appreciation can make all the difference in the world. That's why it's not only important to practice gratitude yourself, but also to foster a culture of gratitude with your team, your organization, your home, your family, uh, your, your marriage. Uh, it's vital for the health of each of those relationships. This morning I want to I uh, head into Luke chapter 17, and it's a great story of, of uh, a man who, who returned to say thank you to Jesus for Jesus' act of kindness in healing his life. But first of all, I just want to say a thank you or a thankful attitude transcends cultural differences. And let's look at Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, it starts off in verse 11, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. So our passage unfolds with Jesus traveling um, along a, um, a very interesting corridor for the Jews. Now the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They, they were bitter enemies. Uh, the, the Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile, which to the, to the Jews was a, um, uh, was a defilement of their Jewish heritage and their Jewish blood. So these people had no control over who their parents married or who their parents were involved with, but the product of that was somebody that the Jews would deem to be impure. And so the Samaritans and the Jews obviously did not get along, and the Jews avoided traveling Samarita, uh, Samaria, would often go around rather than through. So. Jesus defied all these cultural barriers and norms, and he had no problem interacting with, with the Samaritan. Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, uh, anyone that was deemed unclean by the Jews, Jesus would have no problem interacting with. So the first thing we talked about is a thankful attitude transcends cultural differences. We're going to see how this, uh, uh, I guess, um, reveals itself further along as we get into this story. And so verse 12 says, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. So I want to say a thankful attitude looks beyond our circumstances. So here he was 
walking into a village, and ten men who had leprosy kind of converged on him. Now, this is a really interesting dynamic. Uh, once you understand what the disease of leprosy um, brought about. So as he enters a village, these ten men came up to him, and they were standing at a distance, because with leprosy, you couldn't just walk right up to somebody. You, you basically had to continually to announce your presence with a loud voice. And so leprosy, reason being is leprosy is a debil debilitating and isolating disease. And it rendered those individuals outcasts from society. Yet their desperation led them to find somehow a cure. They heard Jesus was going to be in the area, and so they, they were, it was almost like a last resort that they were going to go to Jesus. So th this disease is absolutely horrific and horrendous. It attacks the body, leaving sores and causing um, uh, parts of the body to rot and decay and to, in some places, fall off. Missing fingers, missing toes, nose, ears, um, parts of, of, of a person's demeanor, face, arms, hands. Uh, it, these, it damaged the limbs by destroying the nerve endings. And it was so painful and it was so destructive and, and in, in some cases, it just smelled of rotting flesh. So not only did the people stay away because of the disease itself, but people steered clear of, of anybody that had leprosy because the smell was so horrific. And so the problem with this disease is that there's no cure, and it could last for 30 years running its course through a person's body. And in that time span... Um, the, the person's body just begins to literally fall apart. Um, it is absolutely a horrible disease. And it's impossible to fathom what that is like 2,000 years ago without the medical treatment of modern science that we have today, as far as especially the pain management. They, they had nothing. They, they lived in constant misery every day, 24 hours a day. Um, the emotional pain is even greater because the, uh, the individual was removed from family, from work, from their community, from their friends, from the day-to-day -day interactions. They couldn't go to the market. They couldn't go anywhere where there were people because they, had, they were shunned because of this disease that was actually very, um, uh, you could contract this disease um, and so it was just really, everybody just stayed away from it. So this person was removed from his children, his grandchildren, um, immediately. I mean, they didn't have time to say goodbye. Once they were declared leprous, they were shunned immediately. And so his wife wouldn't be allowed to kiss him. His children wouldn't be allowed to hug him. He couldn't hold his grandchildren um, there was just no way, and not only from the people's standpoint, but the individual themselves would not ever want to um, in, inflict this disease on somebody. So they also stayed away, and so the whole mental, physical, emotional impact on this was absolutely devastating. You basically had no relationship with anybody outside of somebody else that had leprosy, which is why these 10 people hung together for community. And so moving into verse the, next, or the end of that verse 13, it says, they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So they came to Jesus, and from a distance they cried out. And, and rather than crying out unclean, they cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. Again, this was their last-ditch effort in their mind's eye for any kind of relief, any kind of healing, any kind of intervention. So my third point is, is a thankful attitude looks to Jesus. You see, the doctors couldn't heal them. The, um, the, uh, the priests couldn't heal them. Uh, there was nobody to heal them. The only person that could heal them they had heard about was Jesus. 
and they, and they sought him out, and they cried out to him. And, and I really truly believe that in our culture, when things are so horrific, and we look around at all the different things, the only answer to those things is Jesus. A thankful attitude looks to Jesus. So they stood at a distance, called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So lepers had a tendency to hang together, roam together, looking for food, begging for assistance, uh, learning to yell in loud voices so not, not only people uh, knew that they were coming and could get out of the way, but also if people wanted to help. They lived off of the generosity of others. So if people knew that, um, that they had a loved one with leprosy, they would, they would put food out, clothing out, um, whatever medicine they had, whatever that that individual needed, they would, they would put it out. That person would announce their presence and people would bring things to take care of them. Those that had a heart of compassion for those who were battling with, um, with this. Now, this wasn't necessarily just a physical thing. This was a law that when they're deemed unclean by the priests, the law basically says you can't have interaction with anybody else. So not only are they condemned physically, but legally as well, they are condemned and cannot have any interaction with anyone else. And so they relied entirely on the generosity of, of others. And then in verse 14, when he saw them, Jesus, when he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. This is an interesting thing. In, in another portion of, of the Gospels, we see where Jesus actually laid hands on a leprous man, which again was breaking taboo. Jesus laid hands on him and, and he was healed. And in this particular case, Jesus did not, it doesn't say Jesus walked to them, Jesus um, talked to them outside of saying this, uh, this sentence, go show yourselves to the priest. It doesn't show any physical interaction that Jesus had with them. He just said, go and show yourselves to the priest, which is interesting because it was the priest that first declared them unclean. And now Jesus is telling them to go back to the very person that they were deemed unclean. And so a thankful attitude, number four, a thankful attitude walks in obedience, even when everything else around you doesn't make sense. They, they really didn't understand Jesus' ask because they're looking at themselves and they're looking at their damaged hands, their, their faces, their, their missing limbs, their, their whole body racked with this horrific disease. And it's like, you're asking me in my state and condition to go back to the person who declared me unclean. In fact, I'm probably in a worse condition than when I was first deemed unclean. And so the whole dynamic is, is playing out in their minds of how is this going to work. And the Bible says that the local priests had duties other than spiritual duties, leading worship and leading the people in, um, in their prayers and all of that. Uh, he was also kind of a health official, and if a person was miraculously healed of leprosy, the priest would inspect the body, test for removal of the disease, and announce that person healed. Well, and in, in such cases, the person would have been cleansed, and at that point, it's fine for the leper to go back to his family, go back to work, go back to the market, go back to interaction with people. However, uh, if that, if, when the priest gives them the okay, boom, it's okay. But however, there has never been a recorded uh, natural healing of leprosy. Every time that leprosy was healed, it was healed as a result of a miraculous move of God. Miriam in the Old Testament, um, uh, Naaman, the, uh, the palace official, the, uh, the guard, was healed of leprosy. And then the man whom Jesus laid hands on, healed of leprosy. And so there's real no known cure for this. And so these men are now looking at each other going, what is he asking of us? So when Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest, and they looked around at their own selves as well as everyone else who was still mangled, that these men were no better off 
than when they had a few moments earlier when they cried out to Jesus to have mercy on them. And then it says, and as they went, they were cleansed. So a thankful attitude walks in obedience. A thankful attitude walks in obedience. So when Jesus said that, they turned. And rather than turn to go back to where they were or what they were doing, because I think sometimes when, when Jesus asks us to do something, we want the immediate result. And, we, and when we don't get that immediate result, what ends up happening is we just kind of go back to way, the way, where we were rather than taking those steps of faith. So they turned, and where did they turn? They turned to go to the temple to show the priest their condition. And as they turned, and as they began walking back towards the temple to show the priest, they began to look. And all of a sudden, they looked at the person ahead of them and they could see that that person who did not have an ear now had an ear. That person who didn't have a hand now had a hand. That person who lost all of his fingers now has fingers. That person that's walking with the limp and dragging his foot is now walking strongly. And now they're looking at themselves and they're beginning to see that, they are, are, that they're healed and, and that, they, that they're being healed. Every step that they're taking, something is changing and happening in their body. I would have loved to have been there to have seen this miraculous transformation happening. Now, they didn't get healed and then run away to go back to their normal life. They followed in obedience to go to the priest to be declared free and clean. And once that declaration happened, now they're able to go back into culture and society and, and live their lives in a normal way rather than confined uh, because of the uh, boundaries of, of leprosy. So as they began to uh, sense and feel and look at one another, I can imagine the, the joy that just began to rise in the hearts. So this miracle only happened because these men walked it out in obedience, one step at a time. And so this is so phenomenal and so reflective of our own spirit of thankfulness that as we begin to walk out our faith, as we begin to, to walk in obedience to God, we begin to see things in our own life become change, changed and different and, and we find hope and we find joy and we find our attitudes being changed. We find our demeanor being changed. We find ourselves smiling. We find ourselves looking at things through a different perspective, a different lens. We, we begin to see God moving in ways that we never noticed before. Uh, our, our whole observation takes on a whole new meaning, a whole new way of life. And what we begin to do is there is a surge of joy and thankfulness that begins to rise within us. As these lepers began to see things happening, there's just a surge of, of excitement. So when God begins to do something in our lives, we begin to see the fact that how much God loves us. And out of that, God gives us that opportunity to be thankful even when there's nothing about our circumstances that would give us that option or opportunity. So this is the very essence of faith. When we walk out our faith, regardless of the circumstances and situations, when we walk out our faith in thankfulness. You've heard me share the verse of Scripture found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18. It says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing or pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. You heard me say it without beating a dead horse. 
Give thanks in, not for all circumstances. You're in the midst of trial and tribulation, give thanks to God. You're in the midst of uh, difficult news, uh, horrific medical uh, 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 things, emotional stress and trauma, give thanks to God. Not for, but in those circumstances. And it goes on to say, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So then the fifth thing is, a thankful attitude is our worship. Verse 15 says, One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. I'll get back to that point in just a moment. But um, when he saw he was healed, declared, declared clean, came back to Jesus Praising God in a loud voice, threw himself at Jesus' feet. No, no more distance, no more separation. And I can imagine that he just wrapped his arms around Jesus' knees and just sobbed and held him there. I mean, you got to think of all that he had lost and now God had given back to him. How many times do we go through life and experience horrific things in our life and we, we have this semblance of loss. But then coming back to Christ, we find that Jesus gives it all back to us in, in so many different ways, so many more profound ways, deeper ways. And this man came and he wrapped his le arms around Jesus' legs and he gave thanks to God. Now, this is an act of worship. When we think about this, it's an act of worship. When we truly begin to thank God for what he's done, and we truly begin to thank God for who he is, it is a true act of genuine, sincere worship. You see, this man came back to Jesus praising God because he was thankful. He was very public about it. He wasn't private. He was very loud about it. He wasn't shy. Um, and the reason why he was so loud is because he was used to being so loud to announce his presence that if he had to announce his presence loudly because of his detriment, sickness, separation, how much more loudly would he proclaim his acceptance and, and his healing and his relationship with God? Um, how long had he been shouting? Years, probably. And he wasn't going to come to Jesus quietly because of what Jesus had done. And then the interesting thing is, is he was a Samaritan. Again, Samaritans didn't have anything to do with the Jews. Again, there was this animosity. And here was this Samaritan coming to Jesus with a broken, sincere, full heart of love and worship, celebrating who Jesus was and what Jesus had done. And what were the other nine? Were they Samaritans as well? We don't know. Because of the sin, not sin, because of the physical um, uh, uh, separation of leprosy, I don't think it really mattered whether you were Jew or Gentile. You, you were just craving companionship, craving somebody to have interaction with that it didn't matter. So we don't know whether any of the other um, uh, lepers were Jews or Samaritans. We just know that Jesus points out this one particular leper was a Samaritan and he came back to honor Jesus. And so Jesus then asked in verse 17, where's everybody else? Where are the other nine? We're not 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise except this foreigner? So where were they? You know, I, I, I think they probably ran off to their families. Who knows how long they had this terrible dreaded disease. They were coming back to see their children, hold their children for the first time in years, love their wives, hug them, kiss them, to see friends and, and other loved ones, to run to the market, to go to those things that they had so missed over that course of time of that disease declaration. And so I think we do the same thing. When God does something for us, what do we do? You know, we go running back to what we, what we knew before. We go running back to those things 
that gave us pleasure. We go running back to those things that gave us identity. We go running back to those things that were so um, a, a part of fulfillment in our lives. But yet, when we look at truly um, being thankful, the before that foreigner Samaritan did anything else, I'm, I know he ran back to his family. I know he got integrated back into culture and society. I know he did all of that. But the very first thing he did was come back to Jesus and give thanks. And then in verse 19, he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Rise and go, your faith has made you well. So lastly, a thankful attitude heals us. I don't know about you this morning, but I think there are those of us here that need healing. We've been hurt, We've been, we carry all kinds of pain. We've built up walls. We pull back from people. We, we maybe have people on our list. That's not that naughty list. And so there's a lot of unforgiveness. There's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of strife. And, and so when we begin to walk in thankfulness, I don't know if there was any Jews that had hurt the Samaritan or any, any Jews that the Samaritan had hurt. And, and, and so, I mean, it's, it's just all speculation when you think about that. But knowing that culture of the day, you know that there was all kinds of uh, issues that that man probably was dealing with. And, and yet Jesus said, your Faith has made you well. Well, when you look at this, um, Psalm 107, verse 1 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. So when we acknowledge who Jesus is, when we acknowledge the Lord and give him praise, the, the idea of that, when Jesus said, Your faith has made you well, it wasn't a medical term that Jesus used. It was a spiritual term. The word in, in the Greek, made you well, that word well is sozo, which means saved. That basically, spiritually, that man became saved. He became a follower of Christ. When you go back to his praise and all the celebration that he did, um, I, I think there was a proclamation of him um, praising the Lord as Messiah, praising the Lord as Savior, not just praising the Lord to say thank you, but it was acknowledging his, uh, his deity, his divine presence. And so he was proclaiming Christ not only as the healer of his body, but the healer of his soul. He found something that was even more missing in his life. And, and it wasn't physical, but it was spiritual. And Jesus said, your faith has made you well or saved. As I close this morning, um, there was a story about a pastor who went on a short-term missions trip in 1996. He went to um, India. And so there was a leper colony on the island of Tobango. And there, there was a worship service there was a, a healing service, and, and at the very end, they were going to sing um, one last song. So the pastor asked anybody if they had a request. And this woman in this leper colony, um, she had been facing away from the pulpit the whole time. And when he asked for a request, she turned and faced him, and uh, the pastor said it was the most hideous face I had ever seen. Her nose and her ears were completely gone. The disease had destroyed her lips. She lifted a fingerless hand in the air and asked, Can we sing Count Your Many Blessings? Overcome with emotion, the, the pastor left the service and as he was leaving, he was followed out by one of the team members who, who said to him, Pastor, I guess you'll never be able to sing that song again. And the pastor said this, yes, I will. But I'll never sing that song 
the same way. I'll never sing that song again the same way. You know, as we close this morning, may our thankfulness help us to see things that we will never see the same way. For when you see things through an attitude of being thankful, then we're not going to see our hurt, our pain, our struggles, our situations, our circumstances, um, our, um, those things that um, create bitterness, those things that create separation, those things that cause question, those things that challenge us, we're never going to see them the same way again because we will no longer see them through the eyes of loss, but we will see them through the eyes of thankful gain. What are you truly thankful for? Are you thankful in all your circumstances? Are you thankful for even the littlest things that God has done? It may not be what you were wanting or expecting, but God has done something. Are you thankful? I truly believe that when we have a thankful heart, a thankful attitude, the Spirit of God heals us and brings us into right relationship with him. Join with me today as we celebrate another day that the Lord has made. Join with me today by saying thank you. I'm thankful for you, but most importantly, I'm thankful to God. God bless you all. Join us next week as we begin our new series, heading into the Advent season talking about Christmas, talking about Christ. And we are going to be sharing from the book of Isaiah and looking at how Isaiah looked at the coming of the Messiah. So God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Thankful for you. Bye now. I'm a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God